question of panel and comparison, clearly the question of comparison uh, is also a question of uh, commensuration and incommensurability, singularity, many of the other questions of what resists comparison as much as what enables and uh, might revivify it. Um, so we're going to start again on the, uh, the call and response model uh, with Arnold de Vogler, who teaches American studies in the School of Critical Studies at Cal Arts. Uh, and has uh, written and has got numerous publications to uh, his name. Most importantly, and uh, most recently, Finance Fictions, published by Fordham University Press. Respondent is Gabriela de Costa Luzma, who studies early media literature uh, at ICLS and in English, and is interested primarily in Anglo Saxon conceptions of the body. All right, um, the program states my title is uh, The Incomparable, but I should say it's actually against the incomparable, so sorry if I tricked you uh, with that one. Uh, I am the, the other half of the ICLS couple that was mentioned earlier on in the uh, uh, conference proceedings. Um, some of you heard yesterday about Gertrude uh, Spivak's matchmaking talents when it comes to teach, team teaching. She has other matchmaking talents as well. <laughs> I'll uh, try to breeze through this. Um, as some of you know, I work mostly on contemporary US fiction, but I've also done a lot of work in continental philosophy or theory. I specialize in political thought. And I teach BFA, MFA, as well as MA students at an arts institute. So I wanted to relate to the comparative experience that I've had teaching political thought to artists. It revolves around what I've been calling aesthetic exceptionalism. A phrase that sounds like a piece of theory jargon that should and probably will be referred to the trash heap of contemporary thought. <laughs> I've been using it against my better editorial judgment to refer to the belief, and I'm using that word purposefully here, that artists and art are somehow exceptional. Evidence of aesthetic exceptionalism is all over art theory. I, I think I'll just give two quick examples. In his book, The Century, Alain Badiou understands the effect of art as, quote, quote, forcing a thinking to declare in its area of concern the state of exception, end quote. And he values this positively. When Steve Corcoran characterizes the connection between aesthetics and politics in the work of Jacques Rancière, he suggests that in Rancière, quote, art and politics can be understood such that their specificity is seen to reside in their contingent suspension of the rules governing normal experience, end quote. They find each other, art and politics, in that they both depend on, quote, an innovative leap from the logic that ordinarily governs human situations, end quote. But where have we heard this before? When artists take my contemporary political thought class, they'll often point out that this sounds like the work of Carl Schmitt. Art is associated with the state of exception and the suspension of the law that Schmitt deems to be the key activity of, sovereign, of the sovereign. Sounds like isn't good argument, of course. But my students certainly aren't the only ones to pick up on this. In an early review of Badiou's being an event, Jean-François Lyotard had already remarked that Badiou's theory of the subject strangely mirrors, as Lyotard put it, Schmitt's theory of sovereignty. But my students, and not only my students, tend to be highly critical of Schmitt and even of his political recuperation in left liberalism, and they tend to get quotes by Rancière or Badiou tattooed on their forearms. <laughs> I'm interested in that difference, which for me has opened up the com in the comparative space between aesthetics and politics. Just to be clear, I certainly don't want to say that Rancière and Badiou's takes on art and politics are the same, or that they are in any deep way Schmidians. Rancière, in my view, definitely isn't, although there is a Finnish guy who has made the case. About Badiou's connection to Schmidt, there has been some discussion in the work of Peter Hallward, Nina Power, and Colin Wright. My quick point, however, is very general dubious in politics, but celebrated in art. Exceptionalism is a term, more than a term, a way of thinking and doing, around which critical comparative questions open up. By itself, this is already interesting because the exception tends to be associated with, and here's where I get to my title, the incomparable. I'd say there is a way in which I'm forcing exceptionalism into a comparative discussion here, because the exception is precisely what cannot be compared, what stands outside of comparison. It's the incomparable. In that sense, it's a close cousin of the notion of the event, which has thrived in much recent continental thought, often associated with Schmitt's theory of sovereignty, although it doesn't appear there as a key term. The event is definitely central to, to continue with my same example, Badiou's theory of the subject, small s, which becomes subject, capital S, by declaring his, let's say his, 
fidelity to an event, his in this case. <coughs> so I'd argue that there is a way in which, through continental thought, or theory's undeniable interest in the event and in the event's exceptionalism nugget, the incomparable has thrived. Even if it hasn't been called by that name, the incomparable has done rather well in contemporary theory. I'm pointing this out. Sorry, I'm going to take a quick drink here. I'm pointing this out as a sort of long-delayed reflection, but I think good education often works through these long delays, on a question that Bruce Robbins, him again, posed at the end of the Figures of Comparison graduate student conference that some of us organized for ICLS, then still CCLS, back in 2007. We ended the conference with a faculty roundtable at the Maison Française, and it was as part of that roundtable that Bruce asked about the incomparable. Is there anything, he asked, that cannot be compared? <coughs> I wasn't quite sure what to make of the question. At the time, I read it in the context of memory studies, trauma studies, testimony studies. It evoked, I thought, the problematic idea that some events might stand out in history as incomparable. The view is problematic because it opens up what Michael Rothberg has since characterized as a competitive framework for memory studies. But I've only come to understand very recently how the incomparable has thrived in much continental philosophy in the guise of the event. In other words, I think I quickly picked up on the discourse about certain events as incomparable, but I hadn't quite reversed the logic and thought about the discourse of the event as one of incomparability. With the delay then, Bruce's question has made me think a bit harder about the notion of the event as well. Now I know that in addition to Schmidt's discourse, which has historically become associated with fascism and the Jews, which is associated with communism, political theory has sought to recuperate the notion of the exception from thinkers like Schmidt for democratic purposes. Some of that work stays quite close to Schmidt, Focusing on Schmidt's constitutional theory, Andreas Kalivas writes about Schmidt as a democratic theorist. There are critical political recuperations of Schmidt by left liberalism. You can think of Chantal Mouffe, for example. Bonnie Honig, whom I mentioned uh, before, is probably the best example of a theorist of democratic exceptionalism. But you find this, I think, in Judith Butler's recent work on popular sovereignty as well. I nevertheless wanted to caution here against exceptionalist incomparability and propose as a kind of counterpoint that we consider comparison instead as an unexceptionalizing practice. I'll let that sit for a moment. I'm doing this partly with reference to Emily Apter's recent work on unexceptionality, specifically unexceptional politis, politics, and also Statis Gurguris' reliance on Apter's work to think in anarchic democratic politics in which there is precisely no exception. Both thinkers may enable us to understand something about comparison as an unexceptionalizing method that, in its targeting of exceptionalism, accomplishes a kind of parity or equality between the terms it compares. This is so, I would argue, in spite of Apter's interest in untranslatables, which I read as an exceptionalist project related to the incomparable, as Apter, in her introduction to Against World Literature, makes clear. But her goal there is to bring the incomparable within the sphere of comparison, and as such, this project anticipates, I would argue, her more recent work on the unexceptional. It's worth noting that she opens the Against World Literature book with a discussion of Badiou's hyper-translation of Plato, which she recognizes stands in tension with, quote, his, Badiou's, philosophical commitment to a platonic mathematical ontology that activates the incommensurable, associated with the untranslatable. As an unexceptionalizing way of thinking and doing, comparison, which I've now also associated with translation, can have a major effect, I think, on Western thought and the exceptionalism that, in my view, pervades it. This is not only politically important, as good Gurguris and Apter show, uh, I've learned to experience that we should also push it into the sphere of aesthetics, which is one of exceptionalism's strongholds still. Part of the question, and I'll end with this, is whether this kind of unexceptionalizing comparison could still be called comparison. This is also why, in the abstract that I initially proposed for my presentation, I evoked François Julien, who works between thought in European languages and thought in the Chinese language, and claims that he does not compare. Je ne compare pas, he says. He is a controversial thinker, and I'm happy to talk more about that if you're curious. As a kind of shorthand, let me just note that um, he seems very different to me from those French theorists, in many cases associated with the journal Tel Quel, whose sinophily Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak in her 1981 article French Feminism in an International Frame already targeted for arriving at, quote, the most stupendous generalizations about Chinese writing, end quote, based on no evidence whatsoever, no primary research. She's actually referring to Julia Kristeva's book about Chinese women when she writes this. 
I've been reading my way through all of Julien's work recently because I think it seeks to undo various exceptionalisms of Western thought, ontological, metaphysical, theologic, aesthetic, political. Julien's method, which relies heavily on translation, is not one that marks the difference between identities A and B so as to claim the one over the other. Instead, he operates in what he calls the divergence opened up by the in-between of two cultures in deconstruction. No culture is identical to itself, he argues. There is no cultural identity. Instead, cultures offer resources, he writes of their fecundity, and it is up to us to explore those and make the most of them. While Julien is often associated with post-structuralism and post-modernism, it is worth noting that he shares the methodological language of divergence, écart in French, with the Moroccan post-colonial writer and thinker Abdel Kibir Khatibi. Perhaps it's not just that then that comparison unexceptionalizes, but that comparison finds in unexceptionalism a challenge to think about its methodology and the tensions between difference, identity, and divergence, fecundity, that are in play whenever we compare or not. Thank you. Okay, so for my response, um, thank you, Arna, um, for getting me started. Um, so I believe I share your suspicion of exceptionalism. Uh, and do I have to move into this? What's going on here? Um, and in what follows, I hope to chime in, drawing from my own critical genealogy, which I confess has toured more through Agamben than Schmidt, though they're often cited together, mm -hmm. and more through Mbembe than, say, a Rancière. Mm -hmm. I foreground this alternative genealogy of the concept of sovereignty with a view towards complementing and perhaps ultimately regrounding, resituating your insight into the exceptional as, if you'll allow me, a problem or site of the incomparable which in your analysis you expose for its analytical or political or aesthetic paucity, or to put it more hyperbolically, as the dystopian project of the negation of the comparative, the latter figured as presuming, requiring, seeking, and activating a kind of fundamental ontic equality amongst things thinkable, presaging perhaps a world in which there is nothing incomparable, or in other words, there is comparative possibility without exception. Of course, as you pointed out, this kind of anti-exceptionalism has been elaborated more thoroughly in the realm of politics than in that of aesthetics, the latter of which you, you describe as one of exceptionalism's strongholds. But allow me to tarry briefly in the political stakes of anti-exceptionalism for a moment before attempting to tackle this crucial distinction between the spheres of aesthetics and politics as you describe them. First, Agamemnon's well-rehearsed critique of Schmidt resides primarily in what uh, Jeff Hoisman, I'm not sure if people know who this is, um, author of The Politics of Insecurity, um, describes as the conceptual distinction between, on one hand, the political grounded in a conception of the exception, and on the other, the political grounded in a conception of the exception as the rule. <coughs> I foreground the, the Agambenian articulation of sovereignty because I feel it addresses the extent to which sovereign power, the law, the set, perhaps, um, to cite Agamben citing Badu, requires and rests upon the exception which it nominates and exiles in order to establish itself as a coherent entity, a singular enclosure. Thus, the sovereign claim manages a kind of virtuosic exclusion that metabolizes the presence qua absence of the exile, or, to quote Agamben, what cannot be included in any way is included in the form of the exception. Thus, what emerges in this limit figure is the radical crisis of every possibility of clearly distinguishing between what is outside and what is inside, between exception and rule. I'm going to risk first-person narration here for a moment in order to describe the extent to which Agamben's notion of the state of exception, I'm gonna take a drink of water, um, has always struck me as a searingly accurate depiction of the condition of being African-American in the United States, to name just one possible political and cultural semiosphere um, in which uh, you know, the, Agamben, the Agambenian state of exception could be said to apply. Um, this is, as Alexander Wahelier has demonstrated at length, uh, decidedly not the figure in which Agamben grounds the study of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And like Wahelier, I find Agamben's Eurocentric allusions fretting, to say the least. And yet, to my observation, it is simultaneously a very short step from Agamben to Horton Spillers when she writes that, um, that the body is preceded by the flesh, 
which in her words, creates the distance between cultural vestibularity and culture. The body, she writes, whose flesh carries the female and the male to the frontiers of survival, bears in person the marks of a cultural text whose inside has been turned outside. Here, the body is both a literal biophysical entity and a kind of, and at the same time, a kind of concept metaphor that illuminates varying regimes of social, you know, uh, socio-political configurations. Um, the structural position of the enslaved lies in the, vis in, in Spillers, according to Spillers, um, lies in the vestibular border of the body, qua body politic. The phenomenon of the flesh is just one possible articulation of the extent to which the enslaved subject in the space of exception constitutes the enclosure from which it is ejected, uh, precisely by virtue of being an outsider. Um, thus, your argument that the incomparable and the exceptional collude in a worrisome project of hierarchization with fascistic political constellations on the horizon, in contradistinction to the comparable, the comparative, as a kind of grasping towards a sphere of equality in which nothing is exceptional, strikes me as inarguable. In other words, I agree. <laughs> um, and yet, at this point, I realize I have said nothing about the aesthetic, and this is the central challenge that your analysis poses for our thinking about exceptionalism. In response to this challenge, I am reminded of the work of composer and musicologist George Lewis, who writes and works at the nexus of electronic and computer music, computer-based multimedia installations, and notated and improvisative musical forms. Lewis has written on the Live Algorithms for Music, or LAM, L -A -M, research network developed in 2004 by computer scientist Tim Blackwell and composer Michael Young of Goldsmiths University. Um, whose early work revolved around the development of an artificial music collaborator. The work embarked upon by the composers, artists, software engineers, and researchers in computer science, cognitive science, robotics, and mathematics, who comprised this group, addressed questions of interactivity and non-human agency, and the possibility of either in the attempted artistic exchange between humans and machines. Um, for as social scientist Lucy Suchman has stated, interaction succeeds due not simply to the abilities of any one participant to construct meaningfulness, but also to the possibility of mutually constituting intelligibility in and through interaction. The questions asked by LAM researchers concerning mutual intelligibility between humans and machines reiterates, I think, the question of comparability over and against the incomparable and the exceptional, which you have posed in your talk, and it will perhaps prove unsurprising that the architects of LAM imagine their work with creative machines as, quote, a way of creating a politically inflected, critically imbued aesthetic space, which could lead to some insights valid for many other forms of social intercourse, end quote. In engaging with creative machines, uh, LAM researchers attempted to forge within the experimental aesthetic space opened up by musical improvisation, a zone of intelligibility in which nothing, neither human nor machine, could be exceptional with respect to the principle, let's say principle, of comprehensibility. For those of us who remain unconvinced by post-humanism and object-oriented ontology as political projects, Consider perhaps another observation made by historian John Cruz on 19th century American chattel slavery. He remarks that prior to the mid 19th century, black music was heard by captors and overseers primarily as noise, that is as strange, unfathomable, and incomprehensible. Thus, to briefly con uh, conclude, I want to reiterate the extent to which I agree with your figuration of the comparative as an orientation towards anti-exceptionalism and in response to your call to find instances of this orientation in the realm of aesthetics, I submit that we consider in greater depth the creative output of improvising musicians and artists. Thank you. Okay, so the, um, the next set is um, Alex, uh, Alexis Ferrari-Sobiu, who uh, is a fellow at uh, Lincoln College at the University of Oxford, where he teaches modern German literature. He's currently working on a book project uh, tentatively entitled Globe and Planet in Contemporary Aesthetics. 
His respondent is Yasemin Achebune, who is a first year doctoral student in history and ICLS, uh, who's interested in histories of time and money, uh, and in the social and cultural history of the late Ottoman Empire. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, thank you so much to uh, directors, acting, present and past, and to Sarah and Anaibelisa for the uh, introduction, uh, for the, for the um, uh, invitation is the word. <laughs> it's lovely to be here. Um, Professor Liu, it, it never really occurred to me not to come. Uh, you asked the question in your letter yesterday. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. It was a formative time at Columbia, and I've, I think I've, I've carried ICLS with me all the way uh, across the ocean to the Brexiting little mess of a country that I'm in now. Um, I'll talk about that. The title of my talk is Comparatism in the Age of Brexit. Um, a couple of months ago, the London Review of Books featured an article about the writer John Sturrock. And uh, the article contained a passage in which Sturrock described his home country, the United Kingdom, as a place, and I quote, so gruffly unreceptive to anything even faintly theoretical. Um, the quote itself ended here, but the author of the article, Mary Kay Wilmers, let the sentence continue, placing behind it a semicolon and adding two more words, so that the whole sentence now read, so gruffly unreceptive to anything even faintly theoretical or foreign. The, the sentence somehow resonated because it articulated, it seemed to me, the twin predicament of firstly doing literary studies at a place, Oxford, that is quite intensely suspicious of an overly emphatic relationship with capital T theory, and secondly, doing it in a country, Britain, that is preparing to take back control from a supposed EU vassalage by way of Brexit. At the time, I didn't think of an immediate link between the two parts of the sentence, but when I remembered the London Review article as I was asked by Sarah to reflect for today's event on whether the conditions of theoretical work had changed for me since I had left Columbia, I wondered whether there was more to it, whether there was some intrinsic relationship, that is, between an anti-theoretical bias and a rejection of the foreign, and by extension between the disaffected relationship with theory in the rarefied environment of academic Oxford and the large-scale political process of Brexit. On the one hand, this is of course a laughable proposition. Oxford is one of the most staunchly pro-Remain pro constituencies in all of the UK, and at any rate, I have not come here to perform the facile exercise of Oxford bashing. Um, there is much to be praised there, from the general conditions of work to the attention paid to each individual student, from a commitment to the study of literature amid the dismantling of the liberal arts across much of the UK, to a still very democratic, staff-centered structure of governments, and a genuine and stubborn resistance to the kind of quantification and ruthless corporatization that has infected much of UK academia too. And everywhere, of course, there are individuals working passionately and successfully at times for progressive change. But there are things that I do find deeply problematic when I look at them from the vantage point of my background here at ICLS. There is, first of all, no real institutional place in terms of department, center, or an institute for doing comparative literature at Oxford. This is, I believe, partly the result of that curious reticence against working theoretically, and also incidentally against exposing the students to the possibilities and challenges, the thrill, indeed, of theoretical work. What manifests itself here, I would argue, is a certain unwillingness to entertain seriously precisely that conjunction of CL and S, of comparative literature and society we talked about so much today. Instead, what one finds here often is a form of culturalism that deals structurally in terms of research and as far as teaching modules are concerned in the reified entities of national, mostly European languages and cultures. And though most students study two languages as part of the course in modern languages and literatures, as it is called, these languages and literatures in terms of content, seminars, teaching staff, etc., are kept strictly apart, 
with an additional clear separation of so-called language and so-called content modules. And so the study of literature ultimately is neither theoretical nor transcultural, but really often a form of enhanced language learning with the context, within the context of clearly delineated national, and let's use the term here, borders. If we add to this an almost paranoid suspicion of swift and radical change, and a pervasive sense that what's been done fairly successfully and plushly for some 1,000 years can't all have been so terribly wrong, then perhaps it's not just a facetious proposition to say that maybe Oxford, in all its age-old grandeur, is simply some kind of living embodiment of the very Britain some of the leading Brexit fantasists in their aggressive nostalgia want to make great again. And is it only a coincidence that many of our most ambitious students after graduation are offered coveted places in the UK civil service only to be posted because of their intercultural knowledge and language skills in DEXU, the department of exiting the European Union? I want to close uh, with a few very brief words about my own research, which may be related to some of what I've said here. I've just finished an article in which I propose the term ethnoplanetarity as a sort of complement or corrective to certain facets of that discourse of planetarity that has had much, uh, so much purchase in recent academic discussion. I was surprised when I googled the term that no one had used it before, but I think the, you know, the dustbin looms as well here. Um, Looking at a number of works in which traumatic national histories are refracted through a cosmological lens, I use the prefix ethno not to advocate a return to the category of the national, but to save the planetary, especially when it is mobilized by a Europeanist like me, from a cosmological apoliticism or a Eurocentric pseudo-universalism that would simply replace the triumphant master narrative of the global with the even grander narrative of some kind of earthly belonging. The planetary for me is that which saves us from what Stathis, I think, would call the peril of the one, the undifferentiated nation, for instance, or the globe on our computer, in Gayatri Spivak's phrase. But as ethnoplanetarity, it also tends to Andreas's reminder in the brochure to this conference that there is no real knowledge of theory without knowledge of place, and vice versa. In that sense, then, ethnoplanetarity can also be read as engaging critically and antagonistically the regressive return of various identitarianisms and nationalisms that belong to a symptomatology of contemporary globalization and its discontents and that drive to a considerable degree such developments as Brexit. The national is part of a discourse of planetarity that seeks to engage the legitimate grievances against the condition of globality. But the constellation of ethnoplanetarity as a, the conjunction or articulation of disparate scales and temporalities is always cognizant of its own articulatedness and thus of the disjunctures and dispersals that make imperative a thinking of difference too. It is, one could argue, a doubly subversive discourse that counters at once the one becoming pulsion of globalization and the violent identitarianism on much of today's political terrain. Ethnoplanetarity grounds, but it can also deal in otherness against the rhetoric of the politics of borders and fences. It is attentive to human praxis, but is choose the will to mastery against the discourse of taking back control. And it takes seriously the political histories that have unfolded in the framework of particular nations, but knows of other times and spaces and of the traumas of the past against the delusions of making great again. In this sense, I think it weds theory and an opening towards the foreign or the other, and thus could offer to us one way of doing comparatism in the age of Brexit. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, Anu, thank you for correctly pronouncing both of our last names, <laughs> which was, I think, quite hard, because I think we were the hardest ever last names panel. Um, so I met Alexis for the first time over a month ago at Brownies to chat and get a sense of what our discussion today might look like. 
We quickly started commiserating about the insularity of our respective disciplines at our respective uh, universities in the UK. And our presentations today are born out of that conversation, so you're going to have to indulge us a little bit. Um, so Alexis, as you know, is a fellow at Lin Lincoln College, Oxford, where he teaches in the Faculty of Medieval and Modern Languages. He was also an undergraduate at Oxford, so his experience with UK academia is a lot more expansive than mine. I was only a master's student in the International History Department at the London School of Economics in the last academic year, before I began my PhD here in the fall. Um, before the LSC, I was an undergraduate at Barnard College, so UK academia in post-Brexit Britain was a phenomenon that I observed as an outsider. The LSE is a strange institution, a part of the University of London, while wholly unconnected from the University of London's various other schools in terms of its admissions, finances, and faculty. Uh, it's at once a school of social science <coughs> and a university in its own right. My department, international history, was not all too central to the identity or the operations of the school, as you can tell from the name of the school, the London School of Economics and Political Science. So I want to pick up on the issue of separation or even the segregation of disciplines in, the, in UK academia that Alex Alexis has brought up and reflect a bit on my own experience. Due to the state of London's real estate market, most departments at LSE share small buildings and even uh, floors of buildings sometimes. You would think that you know, interdisciplinary conversations and conferences would be abundant. Uh, you know, there are efforts, but um, one that comes to my mind is the 2017 Millennium Conference hosted at LSE and organized by Millennium, the Journal of International Studies. So the conference last year was titled The Politics of Time in International Relations and was organized by the IR department. I don't know if anyone's been. Um, so the interesting thing about this conference was that I, as a student in the International History Department, working on the social history of time, didn't hear a word about this conference happening until the day before it was happening. And only by chance, because my advisor happened to be on one of the panels, she was sitting on a panel called How Do Historians Think About Time? And no students from the History Department were there to listen to the panel because the IR department hadn't communicated the knowledge of the conference to other departments where it might be of interest to students. When I asked my advisor why no one in history had been told about the conference, she said, it's the LSE, you know, everyone is in their own departmental bubble and nobody speaks to one another. But if the Department of History was not central to LSE, then the instruction of languages at LSE was a complete afterthought. Alexis has told us about the segregation of languages and literature at Oxford. At LSE, languages did not even count as part of your coursework and were not part of your tuition. Um, this meant if you were studying the history of a place where the dominant language of your sources, be they people or poems or manuscripts or newspapers, <coughs> were not in English, then you had to signi uh, incur significant extra out-of-pocket costs to be able to study the thing you wanted to study. The peripheralness of the non-British subject of study in UK academia or on the flip side, the centrality of Britishness to British academia is in strict contrast to what Alexis might call the ethnoplanetarity of ICLS. I've mentioned before that LSE is a condensed place, you know, it's fairly small, it's an urban campus where all that is happening in the way of campus life revolves around one building, and that is the British Library of Political and Economic Science. Uh, the LSE Library is famous for its helical ramp uh, located in the void that's at the core of the building. So the ramp is, is where students kind of chat really briefly and really awkwardly because of differences in the points of elevation between them. This is not very unfamiliar to us from Learner Hall maybe. Um, so the buzzing helical ramps give the impression upon entry through the turnstiles, and yes, the library had turnstiles, that the library is a, is a sort of beehive, uh, a place of somewhat mindless and repetitive production of churning out responses to paper prompts that haven't changed much in the past five decades. Or to reach for a better metaphor, it's like a spinning jenny, where one can produce on one's own, through repetitive motions, more and more quantities of the same and same thing. <laughs> and forgive me if this is too harsh, but my specific experience has made me see the British academic project as the standardized production of a disciplinary intellectual one who has learned thoroughly a canon of works in their particular discipline and learned also to regurgitate that canon, but one who hasn't been pushed to formulate original questions on unexplored topics, who does not dare to inhabit the lacuna between disciplines. 
For me, the LSE library, with its turnstiles, its hushed and perfunctory conversations, its oppressively white interior, and its infamous helical ramp, is an embodiment of what Alexis calls the quantification and ruthless corporatization that has infected much of UK academia, against which he believes there's still pushback at Oxford. Alexis writes these words coming from the perspective of an instructor, where developments such as the REF, the so-called Research Excellence Framework, that is having its heyday in post-Brexit Britain, has posed threats to both the quality of research and the sanity of researchers. If there is one thing joining the graduate worker unionization struggle on this campus in the past few months has taught me, it's that teaching conditions are learning conditions. The very quantified assessment of academic excellence through instruments such as the REF for instructors and the use of never changing, strictly disciplinary prompts for student assessments corporatizes the university environment for both teachers and learners and moves us further and further away from an ideal ethno-planetarian educational experience. Um, I know my presentation has been morbid so far, but all of this is to say that it is such a privilege and an honor to share this space, having the kinds of comparative conversations that I had also missed with all of you today. Thank you. So maybe, maybe we continue to walk the dark side. Um, <laughs> so the, the final um, set of um, collaborations uh, is uh, Fuad Torshizi, who is Assistant Professor of Art History at the Lebanon uh, School of Design, currently working on a manuscript project entitled The Clarity of Meaning, Contemporary Iranian Art, and uh, the Cosmopolitan Ethics of Reading in Art History. Uh, his respondent is Tiana Reed. Uh, who is in the Department of English and Complete at ICLS, uh, with research interests in 20th century literature, feminism, Marxism, poetics, translation, and black studies. Sure. Hello, everyone. And um, I want to also echo my teachers here, my colleagues, <coughs> and my friends here to thank everybody who organized this, and the directors, and uh, Sarah, and Kelly, and uh, and all other people who are in, you know, in, uh, involved in organizing this and inviting me. And also thank you for pairing me with Tiana. Uh, we go back to uh, Gayatri Spivak's, one of those other pairings maybe, <laughs> not intentional necessarily this time, but uh, Gayatri Spivak's Reading Mark seminar for which I was a teaching assistant. Mm -hmm. um, so the way that we are going to do this is not that I will finish and Tiana would actually respond, but in the middle, would, would we call this interjections, which begin from what I started and then, you know, contemplations, uh, end them with contemplations on our own, not necessarily related. But uh, as a side note to the previous panel, I want to ask whether contemplation would necessarily be radically different from the political act or not, because I am sort of involved in kind of a contemplation. But that's a comment we might be want to discuss later. So what drives this brief presentation today is a sense of frustration with the only discipline in which I feel at home. A frustration not with the rigidity of its disciplinary border, the disciplinary borders, or what WJT Mitchell has aptly called the sleepy confines of academic art history, those are undoubtedly major sources of disappointment and fatigue for many of us inhabiting the compartmentalized intellectual spaces of academia, but rather a frustration with art history's unwavering loyalty to the constitutive Eurocentric monolingualism at its core from its early moments of inception as an academic field. Heard rather recently with what art historian Anthony Gardner has called a resurgent focus on North Atlantic relations, art history rushes to move past the post-colonial moment and decolonial methodologies toward a global world, a quote unquote global world, with a paradoxically monolingual overtone, with paradoxically monolingual overtones, in which images either speak in the singular grammar of the global contemporary art or are rendered unrecognizable, invisible. Uh, I'm cognizant that my own act of writing in English is part of that, but I think this is more of a question of, uh, of content and methodology for me here. Um, therefore, it seems that the crucial task at hand is to challenge art history's 
disciplinary borders by confronting them with works that their centers of gravity are not Euro-American and are not produced for the consumption of the field's quote-unquote cosmopolitan audience or itinerant curators. Flat's opening remarks get after the importance of acknowledging from where we write and speak and relatedly to whom, position and audience. And I thought a lot about the home from which I write, Columbia's Department of English and Comparative Literature. And because it is my academic home, I can say that the conjunctive comparative literature designation is often mostly nominal. In other words, perhaps what you call uh, art history's unwavering loyalty to Eurocentric monolingualism can be applied to English and other disciplines as well, especially as it is resolutely attached to the corporate university like the one where we sit today. Um, I would like to say a few words about an example of such a work of art as I'm imagining. This is uh, way to the second uh, part of this uh, writing. Uh, you know, after all, it's it's not an art history presentation, if there or not, there's a, a slide or two. Uh, so I find this example in the works of Mehran Mohajar, a photographer, critic, translator, and educator. I believe Mohajar's photographs open up a potential to move toward the worlding of contemporary Iranian art in that they neither rely on the grammar of westernized global art, nor do they superficially present visual manifestations of otherness and cultural alterity. Uh, works that are deeply grounded in a conversation with Persian literature, Iranian visual traditions, the history and memories that form the artist's understanding of the past and his contemporary existential experience. These images are from Between and Non Between, a series of 80 photographs where Mohajar is seeking the unnameable. It is rather difficult to describe this series as Mahajar has constructed a visual world that hardly lends itself to verbal description. He creates abstract photographs by way of placing his camera, camera's lens behind his fingers, seeing from in between two fingers, or at times covering almost the entire frame with one. Um, there is an extremely narrow orifice from which either discernible objects such as a red flag or Bayezid's mausoleum's dome are made barely visible, or abstract shapes and rays of light are captured. The title of the exhibition Between and Non Between opens multiple entrances to the work. There is a thing in between, but there are also numerous instances where there is nothing between his fingers. Of course, there is always a thing that photography depicts the indisputable rule of indexicality to which Bart calls our attention by reminding what, what a photograph says, sa ete, this has been. But Mohajer's work tends to defy this logic by taking away from us the possibility of decoding his images. This gesture toward what is not to be seen or the act of not seeing and the negating prefix none lead us to a multiplicity of literally and theological traditions among those by Aziz's Gnostic beliefs captured in what Hamid Dabashi has called Karamat literature, dealing with saintly miracles. Anecdotes of Bayezid's conversation with his disciples are most famously chronicles in Attar's magnum opus Tasqueratul Oriya, or biographies of the saints, where he is cited to say that God has bestowed upon Bayezid the ability to see his entire creatures in between his two fingers. Mm -hmm. Following Attar, Rumi, Molana, or what we know here as Rumi, who in multiple instances retells the story of Bayezid, borrows from the Quran in his poetry to relate the Gnostic uni uh, Gnostic's unity with God. There is no God but I, so worship me. La ilaha illa, ana fa'budun. Right? What is dramatically captivating and pertinent to Mahajar's work in Molana's narrative is that Bayezid's claim to be one with God while faced with the objection of his disciple cannot be defended through words, but only through sight. It is here that the speech, sohan, reaches the point of silence, where qalam, or the pen, is broken. Coming to terms with the impossibility of reducing Sufism's reality to the literary, Mohajir steps onto a path paved by Rumi, Attar, Sanayi, and the rest, including those of his relative contemporaries, such as Bijan al to untiringly, uh, untiringly contemplate this reality in the domain of the visual. 
the knowledge or more accurately gnosis of an instant in which the pen breaks when discourse reaches its limits is integral to a meditative search for the truth predicated on unceasing repetition, a repetition not only central to Sufism and Zik, rhythmic repetition of the name of God, but also frequently appearing in Persian literature. So Mahajir's camera in a literally pulling inward move, an erotic gesture toward endorsing what is the other, <coughs> is placed somewhere between the photographs, eye, photographer's eyes and his fingers, as if it is integrated into his body. The significance of this integration is that it liberates Mahajir's work from a consistent need to allude to the presence of a seeing machine meditating his experience in framing the war. It is through images made possible by negation, both in the gesture made by the artist's fingers resembling law, which is how law is written in Arabic actually, mm -hmm. um, fingers resembling law, and by the negation of the visible, and this is in contradistinction with uh, the visual, a discernible referential photograph of a thing that is out there, then Mahajir creates a visual constellation which turns into an amorphous meeting point of literary, visual, theological and Gnostic traditions of his located world. Mahajir's visual world, built with the idiomatic vocabulary he deeply roots in literature and theology, is that which is not reducible to the quote-unquote global language of art history. It is an alternative that demands recognition and refuses to subscribe to the monolinguality of art history. I want to pause for a moment on Bart's Society that Fawad re renegotiates through um, Mohajer's stunning work, work which I was introduced, through this introduced to through this conversation. Um, Society is often translated into English as either <coughs> this has been, that has been, or it has been. The damage <coughs> between it, this, and that, the difference in these pronouns indexes <coughs> a kind of distance, physical, emotional, and temporal distance. And I'll repeat um, a line just read worth lingering on. Mohajer's camera, in a literally pulling inward mood, an erotic gesture toward endorsing what is the other, is placed somewhere between the photographer's eyes and his fingers as if it is integrated into his body. A fogging of difference. In this acknowledgment of Mohajer's photographic touch, erotic, Fouad shows not only how the visual can be monolingual, but also how monolingualism isn't only about the dominance of English, but also refers to the persistence of a single method, content, and very grammar. I will give an example not from art, but from my own life and my kind of coming to this position here at ICLS. I began to learn French in kindergarten at the age of four. My French has never been perfect, but the gift but that was the gift of my Toronto Public Schools French Immersion Program, and it opened me up as a child to the fact of other languages and thus to the task of language learning. But it was, al <coughs> excuse me, but it was almost 20 years later, thanks to ICLS, that I began to have the desire to learn German and Italian in, in order to read basically Marx and Gramsci in the original. Today, I will share some of that learning with you in English, and I'm gonna read a passage um, that reminded me of some of the comments um, today. Um, and it's um, a Gramsci quote from Warren Colonies, and I'm using a translation by, um, in the new book, Late Colonial Sublime, it's the um, epigraph to Sohoda's new book. Um, quote, and we, and we arrive at this hardly comforting conclusion. We Europeans, and especially we French, have a tendency toward egocentrism. We believe ourselves the center of the universe, and we can barely imagine that beyond us, beyond our old continental sphere, there are huge upsurges of human action, such that there are events already developing which can have decisive, decisive repercussions on our destiny. It is only a matter of time before the war in the colonies becomes the European war. The line I... End quote. <laughs> the line I really want to linger on here is the one that <coughs> describes a violent egocentrism. <coughs> we believe ourselves uh, the center of the universe. Here we get something like untranslatability, something like complicity, and these are concepts that I learned through the study of comparative literature. 
that, un that unacknowledged fact that we are folded together, though never in, in an equal fashion. Um, so in order to go back to our history and to finish, because I'm a very recent graduate of ISIL, it's 2017, and I cannot you know, really ponder upon how the field has changed, so I'm going to basically focus on what I have learned here. So not to create a, also a straw, man, a straw man out of the discipline of art history here, but I think it is safe to say that while art history has made use of a variety of methodologies across humanities and social sciences, and every now and then has recognized the significance of that which it has systematically marginalized in the name of clarity and legibility as its very core, has remained impervious to those forms of alter alterity that are not reducible to the monolingual frames of legibility it harbors. So the question here in thinking about comparative literature vis-a-vis -vis art history is not one of methodology, or at least for me it isn't. I'm less interested in the role of comparatism qua method in reinvigorating art history's disciplinary sluggishness. As, a constructive, uh, as constructive as such a relationship can be, perhaps even for both, what I am more interested is in is comparison qua et or comparatism qua ethics, and ethics of readership. In reading the other, in interpreting the foreign, quote unquote, as necessary as it may be, uh, it is hardly enough to merely acknowledge the limits of one's hegemonic monolingualism. And this goes back to what Anja and Ben were talking the first time about the you know, insufficiency of the self-reflexivity in, in the space of, uh, of uh, comparative literature. Insofar as any interpretation of works of art from unfamiliar cultures, and I'm quoting uh, Carolyn Steedman here, uh, is not only to reveal the convention of our own metaphoric system, end of quote, or to inflate our sense of multicultural tolerance, there needs to be a dehegemonizing of one's own subject position. The first step toward addressing the epistemic violence of the colonial and new colonial cartography of the world, as well as toward a substantial reorganizing of hegemonic knowledges, must be grounded in a critical commitment to what Spivak has termed idiomaticity engagement with idiomaticity of what she calls idiomaticity of non-hegemonic languages, whether they are literary or visual, has not only the potential to broaden our outlook beyond the Western realms of meaning production and cosmopolitan imagination, it also keeps us from a regression toward identitarian politics, which more often than not verges on nativism. This is what I hope I have learned from ICLS, and I hope that I continue to learn that how significant it is in any act of reading to maintain an openness to alterity that is defined by speaking to the other, not in our own tongue, uh, not in our own tongue. And again, in the Steve Ox Ford, it is the ethics of alterity irreducible to a politics of identity that makes, quote, theory accountable historically and geographically, end of quote. Thankfully, the urgency of this um, of this is what a few art historians have already recognized, among others, more forcefully, Gardner has reminded uh, art historians that maintaining an ethics of alterity is crucial in the face of neo-colonial capitals, quote, disastrous effects on environment, on subjectivity, and how we negotiate with what we do not or might not know. When, end of quote. Whether new methods in art history promising an ethical readership of the foreign object take the name and properties of mondialization a la Grzynski, transregionality a la Juneja, transmodernity a la Dussel, uh, planetarity a la Spivak, or perhaps a reimagined cosmopolitanism, commitment to idiomaticity remains as the ethical and intellectual guiding principle of our acts of reading that averts us from reducing the unfamiliar to our own frames of legibility. It keeps us from turning interpretation into an instrument of augmentation and consolidation of the monolingualism of hegemonic discourses. And just to conclude briefly, from my own home and position as a literature person, I hear in Fouad's call for a deep reading practice in a general sense that is not chained to a text but leaving the frame, opening, up, opening us up not merely to the fact of other languages, other as in not our own, but what, that, what the recognition of that fact changes also in us.
we've got about 10 minutes, and so if we can um, do what we did with the last um, <coughs> panel, I guess, if uh, everyone wants to take up perhaps one question or comment or a thought to push a little further, and then we can collect a series of questions and then um, call this. I, I think Karen and I are good, so we will the <laughs> 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 Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you for that. Yes, please. All right, I guess it falls to me to begin. Thanks so much for your uh, response. Sorry? Yes, I'm speaking as far as to it. Thank you so much for your response. Uh, I'm not so much going to engage with the theoretical references you brought up. I am, I am engaged with those references. I teach Membe Wehele, for example. So your thinking along those lines is very close to mine. I just wanted to clarify very quickly. Um, uh, uh, two, maybe three points. The first one has to do with um, the point at which you ended talking about uh, concrete, um, uh, let's say, artistic practice, uh, artists at work, so to speak. So I want to make very clear that what I was targeting with my uh, discourse here was specifically what I called aesthetic exceptionalism. I didn't talk about artistic ex exceptionalism, or I wanted to mostly target how people, often philosophers, have talked about art. And uh, part of where that comes from for me is precisely from working with artists. I mean, I teach at a place called California Institute of the Arts. I spend a lot of time with artists in the studio. Uh, one of the terms that I've been working around uh, with my students and that next year I'll start teaching about is what I'm calling unexceptional art. Uh, I'm thinking that a lot of artists have inherited some of this exceptionalist discourse uh, about art through uh, uh, what they read, for example, in their critical studies courses, which is the kind of classes that I teach. But they also know very well that art making is about very often for them getting up at a certain hour in the day, making their way to the studio, uh, putting a, a layer of paint on the painting, uh, going to have a coffee to let it dry, going back to the studio. It's slow work. It's quite unexceptional work. They know that. Yeah, so there's something about how art has been construed, I think, uh, in exceptional terms, in aesthetic discourse, that doesn't quite match the actual on the ground practice. So a lot of what I had to say against aesthetic exceptionalism precisely comes from that, mm -hmm. I think, on the ground experience of unexceptional uh, uh, art. I also wanted to say very briefly that for me, uh, um, uh, when I talk about unexceptional art, I'm not so much talking about it in an indexical way as something that you can point to. I think I'm more interested in what I might call unexceptionalizing tendencies in art practice or art discourse. Um, for me, that might be something like a horizontalizing strategy against the verticality of uh, sovereignty, but it's certainly not about uh, uh, going towards a kind of extreme uh, 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 flatness in this discourse. I am quite interested in maintaining, preserving certain traces of uh, uh, verticality uh, within our discourse. So it's not a kind of a, a, a move towards total flatness, although you might want to describe it as a flattening move. Finally, I wanted to say also that for me these questions resonate with um, the discourse about institutions and institutionalizing that we talked about uh, last night. What we do at moments like this when we celebrate an institution of 20 years, it's a, it's a verticalizing gesture, I think. We are instituting something in a vertical way uh, when we're talking about this. And so um, one of the questions that I, I had last night when people were talking about how uh, ICLS or CCLS, when it started out, was sort of going against the grain of the institution, uh, was how does one, after 20 years, keep what one might want to call destituent moments uh, alive at an institution like this, in a program like this, in a context like this. Does that become harder after 20 years uh, to do that? Um, does it require a different work after 20 years? So I'm exceptionalizing the institution for me uh, has something to do with this as well. I was quite struck last night how um, Sarah Cole as Dean, when she introduced uh, um, the event, talked about star professors at some point and then what you get in the round table is one person describing themselves as a controlled dilettante, another as a clown of comparison, and the last one talked about how as a 20-year-old they put together their own program at Princeton. So I thought that modesty, whether it is partly false or not, was quite striking as a kind of contrast to the exceptionalizing move of talking about star uh, professors. Certainly, I think I learned a lot from <coughs> the discomfort and the awkwardness precisely in the classroom that for me has something to do with the unexceptional precisely versus uh, the exceptional. So, just those three points. Can I respond? Um, or no? Um, no? Very, very Oh, easily. very short. <laughs> okay. Uh, just one thing. Um, so, uh, I just wanted to point out uh, the distinction you're making between concrete artistic practice, as you call it, um, 
versus aesthetic philosophy. I mean, I just want to call that distinction into question. Um, I don't have, uh, to be completely upfront, I don't have as much um, training in you know the sort of like French aesthetic philosophy. Um, so in that way, as I probably in that way, I probably couldn't take you up on some of the um, your observations about Ranciere. Um, so I'm just coming clean. Um, however, I think part of um, the project of improvisation, both in artistic practice um, and in as kind of like a social philosophy, um, is kind of like disarticulating the um, maybe perhaps arbitrary distinctions between the, between uh, the two things. And I think it connects to um, to uh, Fouad, your question earlier um, is contemplation a political act. Um, so I just want to say that. Um, also, I think I might have missed, so I clearly misread you because I thought you were um, suggesting that uh, a flattening impetus or something was a good thing. And I, yes, I would say. Yes, but not total flatness. That's what I'm saying. Flattening is different from flatness, right? It's flatness. a tendency or a process versus stating a. a There's just grumbling saying <laughs> I don't know. So, well, maybe we can talk later. What is verticality? I mean, it just, to me, I have some reticence about that. Um, but that's all I wanted to say. Okay. Uh, there's a stop sign there as well. So, <laughs> I'll let uh, Okay. I'll just quickly, quickly uh, pick up, I think, on uh, you use the term uh, sort of oppressive whiteness. And I think, Fouad, you just um, talked about openness to alterity. Uh, ben, you talked about the, you know, becoming the interlocutor for an interlocutor and then something incalculable might happen. And I think that's precisely the problem, that that happens too rarely where I am now. I think this it's quite calculable in a way and predictable what happens. And I think that, the, you know, one of the striking differences that I feel coming back here and this kind of, you know, the sort of... Um, uh, the, the joy of theorizing that may, may also kind of lead to to nothing sometimes, but <laughs> like to expose oneself to that um, is something that's that's quite exciting that I don't see quite as much happening quite as much. Ultimately, I think it has to do very much with the question of, of, of diversity, for lack of a better word. I mean, when you look at when I come here, when I walk across campus, it, it's quite striking how different uh, the place looks. And I think that's something that we're struggling with increasingly in the UK in terms of the modern languages. And I'm sorry to sort of go back again to these sort of our slightly, you know, very hands down questions. But um, what's happening in the modern languages is that we sort of get, um, you know, there, there's less and less instruction in the modern languages, precisely what we've been talking about, how important it is to kind of get that sort of instruction in modern languages, deep language learning. It's not happening. It's happening less and less in the UK at the school level. Where is it happening? It's happening at those schools that can afford um, that. So it's the private schools. So we get more and more candidates who are from that kind of most elite sector. And we have a kind of over-representation of those kind of candidates anyway in Oxford. And now it's getting worse and worse in, in that subject, even though the tendency in Oxford is getting better in other subjects. In the modern languages, we get a kind of um, the tendency this year we have, we are just in the process of doing admissions interviews. 14 out of our 18 candidates are from um, private schools. I mean, what they call public schools in the UK, private schools. Um, 14 out of 18, the, um, the, the percentage in the UK of people attending private schools is around 7%. Um, and we're dealing with some sort of 80%. So I think that's something that we somehow, you know, that's something where we need to do something about this, um, making possible that encounter. And the sad thing is that in a way we have ideal conditions for that in Oxford because we have this kind of very close teaching. We have very little quantification. We don't actually assess very much. They sit an exam at the end of their first year and then one at the end of their fourth year. In between that, it's all there's all that potential for you know really thinking through things, not having to get your GPA right in order to kind of um, you know be able to join one of the to to, to get an internship at a great like consulting firm or something like that it it and of course it's a result on the one hand of the the inbuilt privilege that they don't have to care too much about it which is problematic partly but it is there the, the conditions are all there so i think it is really like um, one of the imperatives is to to sort of get this thing right to um get a more diversified conversation 
And I think that's something that um, is quite impressive. It's always improvable, but quite impressive here at ICLS and something that I think have taken and look back to and sometimes think, you know, we need more of that in, in, in the place I'm in, too. Um, we have maybe a few minutes for, for some questions. Yeah, I'm gonna start with it. Yeah. So, so yeah, so maybe if we could collect some questions, but <coughs> also just to be reminded that the project of mass intellectuality is a strange thing, right? I mean, it's um, we're also thinking about what's happening in South Africa with what's happening with you know Indian universities that are uh, you know and, and the nature of public uh, and private institutions there. China. So I mean, it's 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 also. I would like to also kind of shatter the sense that our position here surely is significant and important. But I think the question of mass intellectuality has to be thought of both as a kind of desire, but as a perilous and hazardous global condition, um, not just of precarity, but also of enormous predation of capital and so on. But um, anyway, uh, but yeah, just to take a few questions. Yeah, this is mainly in response to um, the discussion about Britain. I just wanted to point out that one of um, the good things that a faculty syllabus does is it provides accountability, um, whether or not that syllabus is a great one or not. Whereas, um, for example, the, the lecturer in the English department, Cambridge, Priya Gopal, has, had her, has been demonized in the Daily Mail along with her students for apparently arguing that they would like no white authors on the syllabus. Now, that itself is really interesting with what they're saying, but the university response is, there is no syllabus, right? Because it's all decentralized, and this doesn't just happen at universities or colleges, but what I'm suggesting is that the logic of, oh, our students have some <coughs> freedom, and we spend so much individualized attention on them, comes with the risk of a lack of actual accountability. Instead of syllabus, syllabi, there are reading lists, and the, the standard university response will be, well, you know, it's, we're not banning anyone for any individual professor from adding an author to a reading list, that's up to the author, to the professor and the student. But of course there is a tacit syllabus. Um, and I, so I just wanted to point, add that to that discussion. Yeah, yeah I want to thank you for this wonderful panel. Uh, I wanted to add something that sort of tees out um, a thread that I think was occurring in all three dialogues and, and perhaps since yesterday, um, which is which is to come back to this question of who we are, uh, you know, what is ICLS, ICLO, and us. Um, and, and so maybe taking a presentation to think through uh, exceptionality and perhaps the exceptionality of our own interdisciplinarity, um, and think a little bit about, about this question of, of what it is we do in your comparative literature and interdisciplinary, right? So that those are two different things. I'm going to throw in maybe a few other terms. For example, the relational, which I think came up more in the, in the second, um, sorry, in the third, in the third uh, conversation. Uh, but to think a, a little bit about, uh, about to compare, right, to make equal or equal with. Um, the inter, which would be the between, um, uh, and, then, and then the relational, which, which has this dimension also of representation over reports, right, of etymologically speaking. Um, and are those things different? You know, are we mobilizing them all and are we mobilizing them? I want to throw, to throw in another quote um, by El Male, who um, sometimes works on the Moroccan, uh, Jewish Moroccan uh, 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 novelist and thinker, who, in one of his essays on Palestine, uh, where he compares the idea to Nazis and sort of protests against the question of, you know, some things are comparable. He says, identifiable n'est pas identique, which I would actually translate as what one um, uh, can, what, what compares is not the identical. In other words, to say, to compare things is not to say they are the same. So in fact, uh, working against the same <coughs> comparison is, as, as maybe a democratic sort of equalizing their thing. So I just want to throw that in as, as a, big question, a very good question. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to ask, because um, we've been talking and the whole panelists, you know, what does comparison mean and what does it mean to think across these different disciplines and especially to talk about um, the British system was making me think about this. I'm not familiar with the British system, but um, I'm thinking about the division of disciplines and thinking about how we might be able to bring in earlier conversations from today about labor and how the divisions of disciplines, we're talking about the divisions between language and literature, for example, and how at least in the US context with this also often comes concomitant with um, divisions uh, of labor as well and it also happens between the disciplines so I guess my question is sort of like what is the potential for um, comparative intellectual um, thinking not just for furthering um, the way we think and all of this intellectual discourse
discourse, but um, is there a way we can think about it as a potential um, to think more about um, labor conditions in the university? Mm -hmm. Okay, two, two final questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I, well, I can't believe that I'm Comments. sitting in ICS and bringing up the name of Clement Greenberg, but I'm going to. Which is that. Um, I, know, see, I see your question coming, he, so he, we'll go he, ahead. Okay. <laughs> he, he once said, okay, I don't care how they got there, what I'm interested in is results, right? And so what you're talking about is the quotidianness technical boringness or repetitiveness and so on of mm -hmm. artistic practice. Mm -hmm. um, what happened, I mean, do you, where does the, no, the notion of the, the singularity of the work as a work when it's mm -hmm. abandoned or, or yes. supposedly completed fit in the argument that you're making out that? I completely get you about the, about the question of practice, but then what do we do with works in your argument? Yes, I mean, why are you saying singularity? Wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. I got to look into it, I understand. Time for others, yes. Yeah. Question two, yeah. super easy, not really, but super short. Um, it's a very CL and S question. Um, it's uh, sort of to the two, these two groups of, that uh, I'm thinking of. Um, the, the first question is, uh, how comparable is uh, some of this terminology switching between um, comparative, like talking about it in terms of aesthetics or literature, into directly political. Um, so for example, when you were saying the unexceptional, are you also saying, like for example, oh, Schmidian politics, like agonism is not the nature of politics, um, which seems sort of strange, leading to question two, um, I don't understand why this constant uh, claim that the horizontal and the vertical cannot coexist. Uh, if we get our models outside of these sort of very silly um, social movement models that we have, in the United States and parts of Europe. Um, there are plenty of spaces, also like Kerala and India, um, several social movements in uh, South, uh, South Africa, South America, more broadly speaking, that have happily married these kinds of things. And, and uh, this and talk of sovereignty is quite popular, and that brings me to this sort of globalization thing, which is, um, you know, one thing you said, like, EU vassalage. But of course, it's not that Britain was not. A, a Britain as a country actually benefited greatly. Uh, Germany as a country benefits greatly from the EU. But of course, for most British people, it is the right wing critique of the of the EU. Um, it's wrong, but the EU is in fact in service of, of the subjugation of those people. So how can this ethno-planetarity, like, is that a political product or is that merely, are we just talking about comparison? Okay, um, with that, <laughs> thank you all. Um, and uh, I think we're, uh, we've, we've got a, the breakout sessions for yeah, reception. Um